we have so far learned about the enterprise architecture. If you have noticed, we have not introduced any security solution so far. In this module, we will learn about our first security solution, the firewall. In the network architecture we have established, there might be a need that our users want to communicate to servers in the internet. Similarly, we might want to let customers access few of our servers. But the internet also has hackers who might harm our servers. So how do we stop the malicious actors from accessing our network? This is where firewall helps. Firewall is a network security solution that monitors and controls incoming and outgoing network traffic based on a predetermined security rules. Let's break down this definition. Monitor means scans the traffic. Control means allow or block. Incoming means traffic coming from internet to our network. Outgoing means traffic initiated from our network to the internet. We will be talking about the security rules in a while. Basically, firewall acts as a trained gatekeeper allowing or blocking traffic as per the rules. Firewall is a packet filtering device, that is, it scans for each and every single packet that is passing through it. A traditional firewall works at layer 3 and layer 4 of the OSI reference model. The reason I mentioned traditional is because there is another set of firewall called as next generation firewall. You will be learning about these in the future. Now, where should we place the firewall? One option is we could place the firewall after the core switch and before the server LAN. By doing so, we could protect our servers from the attackers, but our user machines are exposed. Alternately, we could place the firewall on the user LAN segment, which will protect the users but expose our servers. Again, this too is not an ideal placement of firewall. By placing the firewall before the router, we could protect the entire company's network. Because the firewalls are placed at the perimeter of the organization's network, it is sometimes referred to as a perimeter firewall or edge firewall. Each segment the firewall separates are called zones. The organization network is called the internal zone or trusted network or sometimes just referred to as LAN. The internet is referred to as external zone, untrusted network or WAN. Let's take a close look at the cable connection of a firewall. Logically, we represent the firewall placement like this. We will map this to physical connection. The connection from IPS will be terminating on our firewall like this. Another port on the firewall will be used to connect to the company's router. Although you might never do the connections yourself in your career, this will help you in understanding how things are physically connected. Next, we will learn about a concept called DMZ. Stands for Demilitarized Zone. DMZ is a segment of firewall where a company's public facing servers are kept. Public facing servers means the servers that are exposed to the customers in the internet. For the company Amazon, it is their web server. Anybody in the world can access their web server and order items they need. Other examples of public facing servers include email servers or FTP server where the customers can upload documents or pictures. DMZ helps in segregating the network segments. The reason behind this is the public facing servers are easy targets for attackers. If and when these public facing servers are compromised by chance, we don't want the attack to impact our internal servers like Active Directory, DNS, DHCP, application servers, database servers, etc. Imagine instead of having a DMZ, we keep the public facing servers like a web server in our server LAN. We know that. The internet which has our users also has attackers. 
Because we want anyone in the internet to access our web server, we configure the firewall to allow traffic on port number 443 from all the IP addresses. Now, if the attacker is ever successful in compromising our web server, he can eventually get hold of all the servers in the server LAN. That's why public facing servers are kept in DMZ like this. Remember, DMZ is a concept and a network segment. It is not a technology. To better understand the concept of DMZ, we will look at a simple example. Let's consider a bank. Now we all know that the most secure place in the bank is its safe or the locker room. Now, consider an ATM. One can argue that because the ATM contains one of the most critical assets of the bank, which is money, it should be kept in the safe room. But by the nature of the operations, ATM are supposed to be used by anyone carrying a debit or credit card. By placing the ATM in the safe, we are allowing everyone to visit our safe room or the locker room. A robber can take advantage of this to learn the internal operations and security of the bank and ultimately plan to rob the bank. That's why, instead of the safe room, ATMs are kept outside the bank. Yes, even though ATM contains most important asset for the bank, it is still placed outside because of the way ATMs are designed to be used. That is, anyone with a card can come and operate the ATM. That's why we hear more news about ATM robberies than bank robberies. Similarly, in the internet world, there are several attacks on the web server or other public facing servers than the internal servers. In this diagram, the bank can be considered as a trusted network, the public is untrusted and the ATM outside the bank can be considered as a DMZ. With all the concepts learned so far, the Overall architecture of our network now looks like this. Next, let's take a look at how firewalls work. As explained earlier, firewalls work on security rules. These rules are also called as access control lists or ACLs. A rule looks something like this. It has source IP address, source port, source zone, destination IP, destination port, destination zone and the action that the firewall should take. In the first rule, we see that when the firewall sees traffic from source IP address of 10.10.5.50 from any source port, asterisk symbol represents any. Coming from the internal zone, trying to reach to the destination IP address of 30.40.50.60 on port number 443 which is on the external zone, the firewall allows the connection. The second rule states that any source IP address with any source port coming from internal zone and communicating to an IP address on the destination port of 80 or 443 in the external zone, then the firewall will deny the connection. One should keep in mind that rules are processed top-down approach and the rules are first match out. Which means if one rule is matched, the appropriate action will be taken and firewall stops processing further rules. Because of these two conditions, the order of the rule is very important. Let's understand this with an example. In the given network diagram, let's assume that we want to block everyone from using internet in the company. Internet means web traffic, which means port number 80 and 443, that is HTTP and HTTPS. But as per policy, we want the marketing team to have access to internet. Considering these two requirements, let's write the rule as follows. To block everyone from accessing the internet, we will write 10.10.20.star from any source port coming from internal zone, trying to connect to any destination IP on port 80 or 443, firewall should block the traffic. Then 
we write the second rule to allow the marketing specialist to access the internet. The rule goes something like this. 10.10.20.4 should be the source IP. Source port is any. Coming from internal zone. Trying to reach to any destination IP address on port number 80 or 443. Action should be allowed. So according to the company policy, we have configured the rules and hope it works as expected. But it won't. This is because of the earlier mentioned concepts of ACLs. They are processed top-down and ACLs are first match out. When the developer with an IP address of 10.10.20.50 tries to access the internet, he is blocked by the first rule, which is as per our policy. But let's see what happens when the marketing team tries to access the internet. As per design, the first rule kicks in and checks is 10.10.20.4 part of 10.10.20.x network? It is. We are not worried about the source port, so it will be a match. Is the traffic coming from internal zone? Yes. Is it trying to reach any destination IP address on port number 80 or 443? Yes. Is it connecting to an IP address in the external zone? Yes. So all the condition of the rules matches and hence the rule action deny will be taken and stop processing any further rules. But according to our company policy, the marketing team should be allowed to access the internet. To fix this, we need to change the order of the rule. We need to write the allow rule above the block rule. Now, the traffic from 10.10.20.4 will be allowed, but the traffic from all other IP addresses will be blocked. With firewall rules, there is a concept of implicit deny, which means in the list of firewall rules, a last rule should be written, which will implicitly deny all the traffic that is not allowed by the rules above it. This will help in blocking all the unknown traffic. The concept is basically this. Either we can block all the known bad and allow the rest of the traffic or we can allow all the good traffic and block the rest. Knowing all the bad traffic is impossible. So it is better to allow what we want and what we know to be good through various rules and simply block the rest. Now let's learn about the different actions a firewall can take. We have seen so far that a firewall can either allow the traffic or block the traffic. Allow is referred to as pass in some firewalls and deny is referred to as block. There is a third action the firewall can take, which is drop. It looks like deny and drop seem to have same effect. But there is a slight difference between the two. When the firewall is set to deny a connection, it blocks the connection and sends a reset packet to the source. When the firewall is set to drop a connection, it just drops the request without giving any message to the source. It is a good practice to deny outbound traffic and drop inbound traffic. So the attacker will not know the presence of firewall. Next, we will look into the concept of a stateful inspection. Consider a scenario where a firewall is allowing communication between computer A with IP address of 10.10.20.6 and computer B with IP address of 10.10.100.3 on port number 25, that is SMTP traffic, which is email. The rule that allows this communication is allow send mail, which is rule number 46. Now consider that A wants to send a mail, which is of 100 KB. For the sake of easy calculations, let's assume each packet can carry 1 KB, which means the email will be broken down into 100 packets. One should realize that the source IP, destination IP and destination port in all these 100 packets is going to be the same. These are the very attributes that a firewall checks for making the decision of either allowing or denying the traffic. Since Firewall is a packet filtering device. It has to scan every packet and allow these packets to pass through because our rule says so. 
which means every packet has to be processed with rule 1, rule 2, rule 3, so on, all the way up to rule 46, and then the traffic is allowed. It looks like firewall is doing a lot of unnecessary work here. Because if we allow one packet of a specific communication, the firewall will anyways allow all the other packets in that communication. Because the source IP, destination IP and destination port are going to be the same. In order to overcome this, firewall vendors introduce the concept of stateful inspection. According to which, when the firewall allows a specific connection, that connection will be put into something called a state table. Now, when the second packet comes in, it does not pass through the rules. Instead, the firewall will check if the specific connection already exists in the state table. If the connection already established, then the packet is not checked with the rules and directly allowed. If the connection does not exist in the state table, then the packet is taken through rule processing. By doing so, the firewall only checks the first packet of a connection and if it is allowed, the subsequent packets are not scanned, thereby saving lots of processing power. One might be thinking that we might have several allowed connections in the state table, which means the firewall will anyways take time to check through each entry to check if the connection of a particular packet exists or not. Yes. It does, but we need to understand that surfing through state table is much faster than processing the rules. Literally, state tables are run in RAM of the firewall and that's why offer 1000 times faster results than processing the rules. So, if the firewall allows a connection and puts it into state table, when does it remove the connection from the state table? It does so for two reasons. First, when the firewall processes the fin packet, which indicate the end of the connection. Second, when the firewall sees a reset in the connection. Finally, let's close the discussion by knowing about the different types of firewalls we have. First, we have packet filtering firewall. These are the traditional firewalls which scan each packet against a set of rules. We have web application firewall which is a specific form of application firewall that filters, monitors and blocks HTTP traffic to and from a web service. Then we have Unified Threat Management, UTM. UTM firewalls are a special type of device that includes features of stateful firewall with antivirus and intrusion prevention support. These are mostly used by SMBs. SMB stands for small to medium size businesses. Then we have next generation firewall, NGFW. These are very similar to UTM devices but are highly customizable. We also have a cloud firewall, which is a firewall as a service. Whenever a firewall is designed using a cloud solution, it is known as a cloud firewall or firewall as a service. Cloud firewalls are typically maintained and run on the internet by managed security service vendors. Finally, we have host firewall. A host firewall is a piece of firewall software that runs on an individual computer or device connected to a network. It is designed to protect the computer it is installed on. This concludes our discussion on firewalls.